Hello, all you hardcore boxing fans out there. How are you doing? Porky, yeah. You know, don't you? You know. That's why you've tuned in. Today, I'm joined by Toby from Cambridge. How are you doing, Toby? I'm very good, mate. You all right? All right. Are you a big boxing fan, Toby? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm absolutely. I am a boxing fan, yeah. I'll probably cut myself in between casual and hardcore. I'm not going to claim I'm a hardcore because there's many things I don't know, but I wouldn't say I'm a casual either, so... Yeah. Uh, we're in between of that, eh, Toby? <laughs> yes, mate, I reckon. Uh, how long have you been a boxing fan since you were a kid? No, probably since I was about 17, 16, 17, and then started really getting into it maybe when I was like 19, 20. So I started off uh, like training it, uh, amateur boxing, before I actually really got interested in watching it and stuff. But yeah, probably about seven years I've been interested. Yeah. All oh, right, that's good. That uh, what was your favorite fighter then at past and present? Um, I'm probably gonna have to go. I like George Groves, I always like George Groves, uh, and that's not necessarily just because of inside the ring. I liked his attitude outside the ring, I liked how gritty he was. Uh, I liked his style, I thought he was entertaining. Yeah, like I said, in and out of the ring, got a good jab. Yeah, it's like George Groves for me was probably as well, I'd say the first um, fight that I was proper emotionally invested in was the um, the first Froch Groves. Yeah. So, yeah, since then, I kind of followed George Groves throughout his whole career. Um, active fighter. I have to say Billy Joe Saunders, to be honest. Because yeah. I just love, when, when he's actually on it, I love watching him box, watching his style, because he's so slick and that, and I think it's a joy to watch, like, proper boxing. Do you think that Billy's... Careers, obviously, he's won everything, but do you think he could have been up there, you know, a bit higher, but done, done better? Um, I think he could have, mate. I mean, it's been very stop-start, hasn't it? It's like he'll have a year and a half off or he'll have a year off or for whatever reason, maybe through fault of his own for his conduct outside the ring, maybe not his fault. Um, but it always seems like he has a fight and he gets himself into a position where he's almost ready for that next big fight. You know, it's always going to be the next big fight. And it just doesn't seem to quite have happened yet. Um, but I think on his day, I'd say Billy Joe Saunders is, you know, up there in the best of the world. I think he could be pound for pound, but it's just not happened yet because of whatever reason, just the time out of the ring. And yeah, I properly rate Billy Joe. Do you feel that... Uh... Billy Joe will beat Canelo at 160 and Golovkin at 160. Um, I think Golovkin, yeah. I think Golovkin's right at the back end of his career now. And I think Billy Joe will be that bit too quick, bit too slick for him. Um, you don't really have to go looking too hard to find Golovkin. And I do think that Billy Joe's movement and speed and footwork would hopefully keep him out of trouble for that fight. Um, so yeah, I think he'd beat Golovkin. Oh. Canelo fight is a bit of a tougher ask, in my opinion, because Canelo is he's elite, isn't he? But if he's going to beat Canelo, then 160 is the way that he's going to do it at. I don't, I don't think he could do it at 168. I think that 160 middleweight is the best for Billy Joe. So I think he's got a chance against Canelo. I'm not going to sit here and say, yeah, he definitely beat him or anything like that, but We've seen Canelo potentially struggle against sort of slick people in the past. Um, and I think, yeah, I think if anyone can do it, then for me, it's Billy Joe. Yeah. Do you feel that... Do you feel that Billy Joe... How can I explain it? Do you think that Billy Joe's waited for Golovkin to get old? Um... To an extent, but I don't think to this point now. Like I think Billy Joe would have had the fight maybe two years ago, something like that. Because I remember, you know, back when he was facing Chris Eubank, say, you know, when he had his fight with Chris Eubank Jr. Yeah. At that point, he would he would openly admit, you know, Golovkin is too much for me right now. He's a wrecking ball, um, and he's going to wait for him for a couple more years and pick that fight at the right time. Yeah, I do think that that right time for him could have been a couple of years ago. Like it could have been much sooner than now. So I don't think he's deliberately waited until this point 
to go into that fight. I think that if the opportunity to have it a couple of years ago or sooner than now had come round, then I think he'd take it and I'd give him a good chance of winning it as well. So, yeah. Do you think that uh, if Billy Joe fights Caleb Beatson, do you think a case can be a similar case can be made for Tyson Fury because he knocked the Vladimir? Well, the the fight never happened, did it? For uh, on four separate occasions. Do you think that fighters like to wait for people to get old and then get them at the right time? Do you think it's about timing, or do you think it's just too many cooks spoil the broth? You know, trying to make the fights. What do you think, Toby? Um. I think there needs to be a middle point because if you leave it for too long, then it doesn't lose its credibility. It's always going to be good to have sort of a name on your resume that's that good. But, you know, you don't want to wait too long and drag it out for too long because I think that the fight will lose its, like lose the appeal. And as well, you know, people can see through that. So if you wait until you find an old man or someone who's clearly passed it, then... I don't really think that's as good as sort of picking it at the right time for you. So, you know, if if you're on your way up and you've got a fighter who's absolutely in their prime and they're taking everyone out, then you can use your head a little bit and think, all right, we'll give them a couple more years and wait till they're on the slides or, you know, wait until they're past that point of your career or you feel like you've brought your level up to meet them so that you can be in a competitive fight. Yeah. You know, if you if you take a fight too early, then that's going to ruin your career, damage your confidence and all that. So you, there's a fine line between picking it at the right time and waiting too long and taking it too early. So, yeah, it's important. Yeah. Uh, all right, then. I want to talk about PEDs in boxing at the moment. Uh, it's not subject. Obviously, obviously Kovalev's just been busted, hasn't he? Yeah. Uh, are you surprised Kovalev got busted? Um. No, I'm not surprised. I'm not. I'm never surprised anymore, to be honest with you, mate, because it happens all the time, don't it? People get popped all the time. It'll come through that they've tested uh, positive for, what is it, synthetic testosterone with Kovalev, something like that. But, yeah, I'm not surprised by it because a lot of them are doing it. And when we find out about it, yeah, it's just like, oh, great, it's another one. So... Do you, think nothing yep. will, do you think nothing will be done until we have a definite ring and the victor of the fight tests positive for performance enhancing drugs? Do you think then will they act with the murder charge and the, the government will come down on them on all this? I think so, mate. I mean, I hope so, because obviously we've had deaths in the ring and things like that. Unfortunately, it's never come out that it's been because of substance abuse. But uh, as you say, you know, Let's say that somebody, God forbid, did die in the ring and then they came out positive, then you, you've got to start taking it seriously. And it, sh it shouldn't even get to that because so often you'll see fighters um, test positive and not enough is done about it. It's sort of, you know, it depends who it is as well. Depending on who it is, yeah. we'll, we'll judge the severity of the consequence. So you might get one guy who's had a fucking pre pre-workout and they might get two years man you might find someone else who's had some tainted meat and then they're going to get six months so yes yeah, it's, it's basically what's in the best interest for whoever's going to be dishing out the fines or how it's going to affect them but you know something needs to be done before it gets to that point where somebody tests positive and a tragedy like that happens do you feel that there's a lot of it going on in uk yeah i do but I, I, not just the UK, I think it's everywhere, but for sure, yeah. Do you think trainers should be punished as well? Um, do I think trainers should be punished? If the fighter fails the test. I know the fighter's responsible for what he puts in his body and the trainer's not within 24 hours a day, but do you just feel that if they put, brought a rule out like that, that the trainer would be banned as well, that the fighter would think, you know what, maybe I shouldn't take this cost? I'm going to put my trainer out of business and he can't train anybody else. Do you think that that would be a, a good a good system to sort of like, you're forgetting other people to fight bullets kind of thing, aren't you? Uh, I think if a trainer was responsible for it and they were sort of pushing someone's hand or saying, I'll take this on the sly, or, you know, this will be fine to do, you won't get caught for it or anything like that. But 
I don't know how you would possibly be able to prove that or how you'd be able to, you know, make them suffer the consequences of it. Because most of the time when people get done for steroids or performance enhancing drugs, they all come out and say they didn't do it anyway. And, it, you know, you, you never know what's happened. So, like, yeah. that, even if they have done it, you can't tell what their motives are for it, let alone if a trainer has been involved in that. So I think whoever is responsible for it and whoever's knowingly allowing it to happen should definitely be held accountable. And if that's the trainer, then, yeah, it should be. Like, no matter who it is, you should be held accountable because you're the person making that happen. But, yeah, how that would happen, I think, would be very hard to uh, hard to do. Yeah. All right, then. Uh... What do you think about the situation with Dylan White and Povetkin having a rematch and Natasha Jonas and Harper in their world title? No rematch, but Dylan White's weren't even the world title. Do you think that seems fair to people like Natasha Jonas? No, I think that Natasha Jonas should have definitely got that rematch. Um, a lot of people had Jonas winning that. I probably had, if I were to score it, I think I scored it a draw. But just to forget scoring, if you to watch that fight, either Jonas has won it or it's a draw. Like I don't, I don't think Terry Harper won that fight, and I so I definitely think that Jonas should get a rematch for that. Mm. Um, in terms of the Dillian White one, I guess it was the it was the box office and Povetkin's obviously signed the clause for the rematch. So if he won that fight like he did, then he's got to do the rematch, doesn't he? What do you think about Amir Khan and Kel Brook? And Eddie you um, getting in touch with both of them after what's gone on between all three of them over the past six months? You, th you think that Eddie's just got the brass neck on him? It's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's about four years too late, isn't it? Like Maybe a bit more than that, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's been fucking years and years and years and years. Like, am I interested in it? Like, faintly, I'd... I'd pay for it, but like I'd be up because it would be pay per view. I think if they were to do it, but it shouldn't be pay per view. I think Kell Brooks obviously just coming off the loss. Uh, what was Amir Khan's last fight? God, uh, Billy Dib, right? Yeah, was that in Saudi? Yeah, yeah. So that was that wasn't nothing really, was it? Wasn't Billy Dib a couple of weights below as well? Yeah, but he just didn't have to boil down, did he? For it, and I mean. Just took him out yeah it was just it was just a fucking bit of a run out for me i can't remember watching it but like yeah it's just too late and there's also going to be a lot less money in the pot as well it's lost its interest for a lot of fans like seeing polls and that on twitter and whatever people saying whether they're going to be interested in it and not really like it's just just long gone for me i like i say i'd watch it but i'm not bothered about it and i think that Brooke can't seem to hold his shot anymore. I think he's had his time. So, yeah, it'd be a great cash out for him, but they're not the fighters that they were. It, it's it's just intriguing. That's it. That's as far as I can go. Do you, well, I can explain. Would you put it past Eddie to put it on Tyson Fury, Joshua undercard if he meant fight? Chief support. I do No, he probably just would. Justify, to justify a £50 pay per view. Would you put it past him? <laughs> Saying you're getting to the one kind of thing. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if you put it at 50 pounds just for Fury Joshua, to be honest. But like hmm. I think if that fight was to happen, they would do a pay-per-view with Kel Brook and Amir Khan topping it and maybe just give it a solid undercard. But how well that would do, I don't know. What do you think about uh Carlos Sowland coming out and saying that he'd like to make Junior Eubank against Kell Brook or Beefy Smith and people like that. What do you uh, think? Beefy Smith. And Amir Khan. You know, no, I don't think he mentioned Amir. I think he mentioned Kell and Beefy, didn't he? Yeah, yeah I think it'd be all right. I mean, I definitely don't want to see Eubank against Brook, that's for sure, because I think that that is a very dangerous fight for Brook and I think he would get ironed out, to be honest with you. And I don't think that Brook can offer anything that's going to bother Eubank because Eubank's tough and he's got a solid chin. You know, he's been in with super middleweights and he's been hit by him and whatever else. And he's he's not been down officially. It was questionable. Oh, sorry, man. 
Sorry, go on, man. I was just going to say that um, Eubank's got a really good chin and he's been in with like bigger hitters than Kel Brook would have been. And I can't see him yeah, being fussed about anything that Brook's got to offer. So Eubank's pretty relentless, especially when he gets you going. And if he catches Brook and Brook even shows a little bit of, oh, I didn't fucking like that, then he'll jump on him. And I, I think it'll be four rounds tops. But I just think Eubank could go straight through him, to be honest, mate. Picture this scenario, Kel Brook, Eubank, round three. Eubank hits him with a flurry and Kel, first time he's hit, he turns away. Would the fans feel cheated at that or would Kel Brook say you were, you were cleared to fight? What Do you think that could be a possible outcome in that fight? You know, Kel maybe quitting? Um, Being no. an eye injury or something? I don't, I don't think Kel Brook could quit. I, th I think... Brooks a warrior, to be honest, from what I've seen of him. I know he's got some stick before for saying that he quit against Golovkin, but the towel was thrown in, and I do think that he would have carried on going. I think that fight was obviously only going one way, but I do think Brook is gritty, and I think he would keep on going until he couldn't. But, yeah. yeah. What did you think about Kel Brook against Crawford? Um, like one four seven after everything that they've gone on with the weight and everything that they said. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that for a start, Kelbrook going down to one four seven is clearly tough on him, uh, and that's been you know they've been saying that it's tough on him for quite some time. So you know if you're going to go up to one five four or whatever weight that you think is going to sit best for you, then you're putting yourself at risk by going down to. Uh, 147 just for a big fight because yeah you're going to get paid well in that and it's a big fight but look at what happened he's like it was it was a clean shot wasn't it it was a sort of hook jab, like, you know it wasn't even his um, was it from southpaw position front hand in southpaw position what wrestled him yeah I think so yeah he he, he, he had a ball to his locker didn't he Crawford didn't he you know he was yeah. at first it weren't working he just changed it up didn't he yeah, I see it. So he changed it over and then caught him and then Brooks, it was, it was all over the place, wasn't he? So, Would you say what, he quit in that he, fight, Kel Brook? Um, no, I don't think he quit. I think, I mean, he was on the ropes and he was taking the bangs, wasn't he? Was he waiting for the ref to jump in? I don't know, but the ref did jump in. But I think he got hit with that shot and he it kind of rocked him and he didn't want to know after that. And whether that's because his chin's gone after the Golovkin and Spence, or he hasn't got the confidence, or whether it's because he was dehydrated and he's no good at, well, not no good at 147, but you know what I mean? He's had to boil down to the weight. So his um, punch resistance has gone. I don't know, but it's, it's not good, is it? It's not good when, you, when you're getting hit with a shot like that and it's having that kind of effect on you. You, you shouldn't be talking about fighting... Chris Eubank, in my opinion, who will take your chin off. All right, then, moving on. Uh, do you think Josh Warrington's been treated fairly since his return to Sky? Um, who's he fought since he's come back on Sky? Uh, I don't think he's had a fight, has he? No. I mean... I must admit, I'm quite disappointed with his opponent. Yeah. Um, I've I've not heard of him until it's been announced. Obviously, add a little look at him. He, he don't look like he's up to much. And we've seen, I've I've read that you know he's not done twelve rounds and he's conveniently fallen into the rankings as well for a nice little IBF defence. So voluntary. Yeah. So that's been nicely done. Um, I don't know. I, I really don't know about that one, to be honest. I, it's a bit disappointing because obviously they've been talking about Kanzu for all this time, haven't they? Yeah. And e even until a week and a half ago, I was probably watching interviews talking about Kanzu or Headingly or whatever else. And now this announcement's come around and we've got this. So it's like, yeah, it's just a bit disappointing when I saw that. Like, I'm not, I'm not asked. I think Josh Warrington's brilliant and I love watching him fight and he's, I love his work rate. I think he's great. But this fight doesn't excite me at all and I expect Warrington will just go through him. Yeah, do you think Josh Warrington's overachieved in his career? Um, 
overachieved. I don't want to say he's overachieved. He's obviously puts the work in, doesn't he? He's incredibly fit and he works incredibly hard. So I think maybe to say he's overachieved isn't actually fair. But in, in terms of his ability, mm. I wouldn't say he's the best boxer in the world, but he's got really good hand speed. His, his fitness is great and he just wears you down over time and he'll have it with you. So, yeah, I rate him. Yeah. Do you think Tyson Fury and Joshua will fight this year, yes or no? Yeah, I do think they will. No, why is that? Because I think it's it's gone too big and it's been spoken about too much. And you, there's interviews coming out from Bob Arum and Eddie Hearn. They're saying, oh, it's 90% there. They're talking about potential venues, all of that. Um, what, what fight can either of them do? To get away with not having that fight, like it, it would be embarrassing. Can't at this fight point. anybody now because the public could turn them. They've gone too far, we haven't they? Yeah, that's that's it. Like if if it doesn't happen at this point, then the public will. Yeah. You know what? We've invested that much in you, and you're just dragging it out. I think they'll what they'll turn on them. We're gonna see. Yeah. Season. And you know what? I'm not even gonna give my opinion on this till you give yours, but. <laughs> what do you think about it going to Saudi? What's your honest opinion? Two Brits fighting in Saudi. Well, at the moment, there can't be any fans anyway. So if it was in Saudi, like now, in coronavirus, I'm not really asked. If it was being Saudi this year or not happen because it's not in the UK, I'd rather see it in Saudi. But if there could be a crowd in the UK and all of that... Um, and then it went to Saudi, then I, you know, I think that'd be a travesty when it's two biggest British boxers, heavyweight unification fight in fucking Saudi Arabia when they could fill up Wembley. I think that'd be, I think it'd be wrong. What excuses do you think will be told if it doesn't happen this year? Um, if it doesn't happen this year, I mean, there's obviously the outstanding situation with Usyk and Wilder, so... I mean, I don't, no one really knows where that lays because there's a lot going on behind the scenes, but I've not seen Usyk say that he will take a stand size or he's not going to, he's going to force the WBO or they've got a vacay or whether Wilder's going to push for this third fight. But, you know, Wilder basically seemed like he didn't want the third fight at all. You didn't see fuck all from him for a very long time. And then all of a sudden, now they're talking about the Joshua Fury, he starts tweeting, saying, oh, you know, don't be a pussy, do it for the fans, we're going to have our third fight. So I don't think Wilder wants that anyway. I just think he was kind of trying to save face a little bit by coming out with that all. Um, beyond those two excuses, maybe they can make an excuse that they couldn't get the money together for them to be paid properly. But I imagine if it's going to Saudi Arabia or something like that, you know, there's going to be an absolutely massive site fee. And on top of that, there's going to be all the pay-per-view buys. So I don't know. It's... They'll come up with something one day. If it doesn't happen, they'll come up with something. But I, I hope it happens. It needs to happen, really, because it's gone too far. Do you think boxing needs this fight this year? Or if it doesn't, if it isn't this year, do you think a lot of fans could just walk? Um, I don't think it needs the fight, but I think... OK, then what fight do you think that we need this year to put boxing back on map? Um, I mean, if any... For me, that is the biggest fight, the Josh Fury one. I'd say it is. So in terms of that, it would need it for that. But like, you know, the show goes on without it, of course. But I think if it doesn't happen, it's been spoken about that much. And, you know, all, all even casuals, everyone's invested in Joshua Fury. You speak to anyone about Joshua Fury, they know that this fight could happen and is looking like it's going to happen. And if it did, if it doesn't, people that, you know, don't understand boxing that well, but just be sat there thinking, why has this fight not happened? Because, you know, it's just, it's just a fucking fight. Just make it. What other fights do you think could be domestic blockbusters this year? Um, I'd quite like to see Liam Williams against Eubank. Yeah. To be honest. Well, I don't think it's not a blockbuster, but for me, I'd absolutely love to see. I really rate Liam Williams. I think he's a savage. And I feel that way about Eubank as well, to be honest. So I think that would be a war. Um, I'd like to see Harper Jonas 
rematch because I think that uh, Natasha Jonas deserves that. And for me, that was one of the standout uh, fights on fight camp, to be honest. So that's another one I'd like to see. Um, they're the two that spring to mind. Can't think of anything else. Wouldn't you like to see Beefy Smith against uh, Yulbank? Yeah, I'd like to, I would like to see that fight. I prefer to see Liam Williams. Um, Beefy Smith doesn't excite me that much. I think you he's. Said, you said that Liam Williams is a savage, and Beefy Smith beat him twice, didn't he? He did, yeah. But I think Liam Williams has come on a lot since then. Yeah, since he went to Dominic Ingle. Yeah, since he's gone to Dominic Ingle, it does look like it's come on leaps and bounds. But also, even though Smith did beat him. I don't think his style's as exciting as Liam Williams. Like Liam Williams, yeah, he, he goes for it and he is, he is an animal when he gets him up. So I can see the styles of Williams and Eubank coming, to, uh, coming together better than Smith Eubank, in my opinion. What about Lyndon Arthur against Callum Johnson or Callum Johnson against Joshua Boazzi? Um... Which one should we talk about first? So Johnson, Watsi, I think, yeah, I'd like to see that fight. I'd like to see Callum Johnson have a fight, to be honest, because it feels like he's just been inactive for too long and he's, he's not being given the opportunity for these fights. I do think that Johnson would actually beat Watsi, to yeah. be honest. I know that Watsi is the hyped up guy and a lot of people would back Watsi, but <clears throat> I think Watsi does look open to the right hand a little bit. We've, I've seen him in a couple of fights get caught with the right hand in that last one against Kalic, uh, lost his eye, but he was, it wasn't like one or two right hands, it was like semi-consistent right hands coming through. And if you're getting caught by Callum Johnson as many times as what you're getting caught from Kalic, I don't think that you'll be, see, I don't think that you'll see the end of the fight. Do you think that Joshua Boazzi wins the world title? Yeah, I think he does. In a couple in a couple of years, keep building him. I think he does. Uh, he's he's being moved at a, a good pace. Uh, he seems tough. I think he's skillful. Yeah, I don't, yeah, he's exciting as well. Watsi is exciting. So just as a fighter, I, I do like to watch him. Um, I think he's got a world title in him in a couple of years. Not definitely not yet. And that weight, light heavyweight. Even domestically, there's good fights from first that he needs to think about before uh, <clears throat> before thinking about world titles. But yeah, uh, what do you think about the situation with Irish boxing at the moment? Who who specifically? No, oh, I mean they don't seem to be putting many shows in over there, do they? Oh uh, no, not at all, mate. To be honest, when I mean when was the last one? <laughs> I don't know, mate. Just don't, don't see what, what do you think? Where do you think that's heading now? What do you think? We're not putting anything on. I think that'll be a thing. No. We can we all the politics going behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, who, who are the biggest names? And I'd probably Frampton, Conlon. Katie Taylor. Kate, okay, Katie Taylor, of course, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd like to see that out there. I think they could make a great card in that. Uh, Frampton went to the stadium out there, didn't he, as well? Yeah. Do you think Frampton uh, wins a world title this year? He's got a title fight, hasn't he? Yeah, he's fighting that Herring, isn't he? Um, I think he's going to beat Herring, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think he is. Yeah, I've seen uh, clips of Herring. He looks solid, but I think Frampton... I do think Frampton's definitely getting on a bit, but I think he's, I think he's got another world title in him, yeah. What next for uh, Derek Warchizora? Derek Warchizora. Um, I don't really know what, what he does next, to be honest. Like, obviously, he's just had his fight with Usyk, hasn't he? He's who, in who, Limbo who, Land. Is he what, sorry? He's in Limbo Land. Yeah, he is. Um, I don't want to see another fight with Dillian White. For a third time, not interested in that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where Derek Chisora goes, to be honest. Do you think uh, Tony Bellew makes a comeback at heavyweight this year? 
<laughs> no, no, he's done, mate. Tiny oh. he's finished, I think. Do you? Yeah, I still think he'll come back again at some point in history. You people reckon? Like, people like that can't help themselves. Yeah, yeah. I do. I do. Yeah, he, he likes the limelight, doesn't he? But I just think if he comes back now, he's... Oh, Tony? No, he doesn't like the limelight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's dangerous for him if he comes back at every weight now. <clears throat> well, if you're getting dropped by cruiserweights, you're not going to do it at every weight, are you? Well, that's it. And I don't, I don't think he's big enough either. No. Do you think you're a good champion? Um, do I think you're a good champion? I mean, it, he won it vacant, didn't he? From uh, a car. He's got vacant. Well, yeah, that's it. I'm trying. I'm trying to think in my head like the names reeled off that the ones that he defended against. Do you think Eddie earned delivered for him financially? Oh, absolutely delivered from financially. It was mainly his last um, his last set of fights, wasn't it? He's had the David Hay. Last four fights, wasn't it? Five, five, yeah. Five, and then the rematch five, and then the Usyk one. What's that, mate? Four pay-per-view, didn't it? Yeah, that's it. So, so Eddie Hearn I... delivered for him. Yeah, I agree with you that. I think Eddie Hearn did a remarkable job with Tony Bell. Remarkable. But do you feel that Tony Bell used... Creep, I don't know what can we call it, arse licking around, around the matchroom skies thing. Do you think it's things like that's what's wrong with boxing? You know, the cringiness of it. Yeah, to an extent. I mean, a lot of a lot of that lot will only sort of acknowledge the matchroom sky. It's all, I know you you obviously say it's a car the Bean Masons and all of that, but I, I, can, I can see where you're coming from with it because it, you know. Oh, the Bean Masons. <laughs> the bean what, do, what do you think to the bean masons would you like to join them no i wouldn't like to join oh. them oh come on you can tell me <laughs> <laughs> I'm, no i'm not interested in the bean masons i like it's frustrating when like the commentary so, um listening to it when they're so biased towards the sky fighters and the match and fires and all that like i um i like the bt sport commentary team for that reason listening to richie woodall say i think he's brilliant it's just, just Completely non-biased commentary, and that's what you're excited, like. isn't it, Richie Woodall? Yeah, <laughs> mate, I love fucking rating. <laughs> God, Richie Woodall. <laughs> yeah, you're not not a fan. Yeah, he's all right, like, but you know, if you, if you're going to name an object after him, it'd be a plank of wood, wouldn't it? Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, but you know, the man knows his stuff, and he's he's non-biased. He says it how it is, and. Yeah, I enjoy listening to him, but I can't stand listening to um, completely ignoring the good work of one fighter. Yeah. And then I, I like fabricating situations that are happening. And if you don't if you don't know boxing that well and you're watching the commentary, then you'll you'll be hearing what they're saying and you'll start to believe it. And you'll be watching them like, yeah, this is so one sided. I can't believe it. And it's, and it's not. Start questioning yourself, don't they? Am I watching the same fight? That's what I mean. When, yeah, when you see the scorecards coming out and you're thinking, oh, he's won that by four or five rounds. And then they've given it three the other way. I'm thinking, fucking hell, what's going on? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, does Adam Smith scare you? <laughs> It doesn't scare me. <laughs> no, can you see, can you see <laughs> something in it that I see? Yeah, he, he scares <laughs> you, <laughs> doesn't he? No, just, <laughs> you think it, when you put it past him, I mean, <laughs> I mean, people in his cell are fired up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> would you? Would, would you put it past him? You know, if it came out about him, you know, all these people, I knew they'd have to kneel before me. <laughs> to kneel before me, I swear to God. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm not, I'm not answering questions. You know, it's not about me. Right? People are going to say, Porky, you was right, I was wrong. <laughs> Everywhere I'll go, every, like a good answer, cafe, local garage, supermarket, wherever I go. Yeah. I'll say, I told you, didn't I? I told you about Adam <laughs> B and they'll go, okay, you told me you was right. <laughs> But now we're only joking, Beanie. But we're on to you. Uh, <laughs> what do you think about this bridge of weight? Um, it's not for me. Not for me. WBC just sort of introduce what they want when they want, really, don't they? Um, 
do you remember me pushing it on channel a few years ago about there being a weight difference from, for example, we have super welter or light middle, 154. Then we have 160 middle, 168 super middle, 175 light heavy. But then one after light heavy is 200 pounds. So the 25 pound difference, I think, is very dangerous for people moving yeah. up. Because they're only going like six and eight pound in the previous three divisions. So I made a big song and dance on it. And I have done for years. So when it all came out, I was like, brilliant. But they didn't do what I proposed. Because I, I wanted to see the 25 pounds put into a light cruiser and a super cruiser. Because they could have had a two divisions and just kept it light and super. But mm. this bridge weight thing, I, I've heard the reasoning behind it. It's because of some, it's the name of somebody who died or something, in it, you know, something like yeah. that. But I just feel that we should have had like a, a one eight five, and, a, and then a two, and then you, you cruise weight two hundred pound, then a two ten, you know, a super cruise up to two ten, and then anything over fifteen stone, I think it, it was sufficient for it to be everywhere. I don't want to see a super heavyweight. But that, that's what I would have liked to have seen. Just just that, just to add them two divisions, but don't make too many tweaks to it, you know, for yeah. safety reasons. But obviously my voice is not as, as they don't listen to me. They've done their own thing. But it's interesting that a lot of governing bodies aren't, are not using that, are they? It, also no, it seems like WBC. Now, doesn't it? Yeah, that's it. It's obviously WBC have been pushing it, but it's had not negative feedback, but a lot of you know, a lot of people dismissing it really. I see a lot of fighters and that not really, not really bothered about it. Like I don't know if it'll actually stick or not. Because yeah. if it's only recognised by WBC at the minute, then what's the point? Yeah. Uh, what do you think about YouTube channels in general? Do you think that there's, there's favourites with certain platforms that have the favourites? And do you think that these people who've got access, do you think they're asking the right questions? Well, there's definitely favourites. Definitely favourites. Um, are they asking the right questions? I think from their perspective, obviously, they've got to be careful about not to piss off the wrong person, haven't they? Because if they do that, then they'll lose their access. So, like, from a fan's perspective, I can see why we, you know, want them to go in on them more and ask them more to yeah. Like more direct questions and that. But at the same time, if you go too far with it, because I know I've seen you talk about um Rob, you know, Rob Tebbett when he was pushing yeah. Smith yeah. and Earl on that. When and then, you? Um pushing Adam Smith and Eddie Rob Tebbett, didn't he? Yeah, I thought, he, I thought he did all right in that interview. But I thought when he had Smith on rack, I thought he let him off. Yeah, like he, he went on. The thing is, Adam Smith's quite a frustrating interview because he kind he just reiterates what he says and he talk, he talks so much around the question that you don't really get a straight answer a lot of the time. And it got to a point in that interview where they were just going back and forth and back and forth. And I just think I've, I've heard the same thing now three or four times in different words. So like, like you're saying, he had him there, but he didn't. Why didn't you say to him, uh, Adam, I think you were dodging the question. Are you going to deliver these fights because the product's watered down? Look what we've had in previous years. Ute, Frotch, Andre Ward, non pay per view. Yeah. And look what we've got now Ted Cheeseman and Sam Eggington, non pay per view. But if you go on and go even further than that, you've got Dylan White against Povetkin as pay per view, but the others couldn't have it. And I just think that. Well, the statistics prove it. The quality is, it's been watered down over the last five, six years, I think. See, I think it's been watered down since Frotch Groves and maybe Fr Vladimir against Joshua. But they keep saying that's a great fight. And I do as well. But when you look at it, it was a man in his 42nd year, wasn't it? Yeah. Coming back to win his belts. And it was sold as this super fight. And it nearly, it was a good fight. So they got that right. But is that going to be it for what they're giving us? Is that the, what is the benchmark? This is where I, I uh, get unhappy about it. I don't, that's just my opinion, but all right then. Uh, do you think that the dates are getting shared out amongst all fighters in the UK correctly? Um, 
<laughs> no, I mean, there's, there's, it's the same ones getting on, isn't it? It's yeah. the same ones getting on. And you see Eddie Hearn justify it, but he'll say, if I give them an opportunity and they say no, then I'll move on and that's it. And he's got fighters that he's contracted to get on, stuff like that, yeah. uh, which I understand. But yeah, it's, it's the same ones over and over again. So I'd like to see, like Joe Gallagher's stable, they're, they're not too active at the minute, are they? So I'd like to see them come about more. And obviously the small hall shows aren't going on either. So there's, there's a lot of fighters stuck at home twiddling their thumbs. What do you think about these YouTubers coming into boxing and earning millions of pounds while other kids who, who are coming up laddered and never probably going to get to that status and they put the time in? Do you agree with that? Uh, and if not, who's at fault? Is it the TV companies or the promoters? I don't disagree with it because I think they've worked hard <clears throat> to build up their platform yeah. on YouTube and whatever else they've got a follow in. So whatever they do... There's always going to be fans what you know what tune in to see it. So if they want if they want to have a go at boxing, then in my opinion they can do that. But I don't think you should market it as if they're fighters because we all know what they are. They're two fucking YouTubers who have got a pro license. Yeah. Uh, and also, you need to be careful with the matchmaking because if you start putting a YouTuber in with someone who's experienced, or for example that Jake Paul fought against um, that Nate Robinson and he'd never had a boxing match and it showed and he got knocked out cold. Mm. So it's fine for entertainment if you've marketed it for what it is and you know what it is and it's competitive. But the second it starts getting like, um, you know, dodgy dodgy matchmaking and that, people start getting hurt. So you've got to be careful with it. What do you think about people coming into the sport in these advisory roles and they've not got a board licence and... Uh... Promising kids earth and not delivering them and things like that and holding them to the contracts and stuff like that. Do you think that that's wrong in sport and that there should just be a, a trainer, manager, a trainer and uh, all managers and does everything, everything from nutrition, strength, on distance, picking fights, a lot. Do you think there should just be a boxer and trainer and that should just be the relationship? Uh, I think that. <laughs> advisory deals managers whatever else i don't i don't think it's necessarily a, a bad thing apart from when you know it's getting ridiculous and you've got 15 people in your entourage or whatever and as long as the people that you're employing have the credentials to do it then i think that's fine but if you get someone come in who you know we don't know it um doesn't know the business so they come in and they start promising this and promising that and then taking 10 percent of your wages and they're not delivering on what they're saying then that's where I think it's going wrong. Yeah. Do you think that uh, Mickey Theo and John Fury will ever fight? Um, I don't know, to be honest. I've not really heard anything from John Fury about it. I know that Mickey, Mickey Theo is uh, beating the drum quite a lot. I've seen your your videos of him and that. He's keen for it to happen. Yeah. So... Is it, is it going to be for charity or was it going to be yeah, for charity? Well, the, Mick wants to do it for uh, charity and for, for NHS and for mental health. Sure. Yeah, so that's, that's nice. I think that's, you know, if there's that behind it as well, then why not? They're, they're two men. They both keep themselves in nick and their age and all that. So why not go for it? But it's will it happen? <laughs> it's, it's not looking likely. From, well, from what I see, I mean, I've... Really, the most I see of it is from your channel. Yeah. So, judging by that, I don't see John Fury talking about or anything like that. So, it's been very quiet, John, hasn't he, lately since I've put these few videos out. So normally, he wants to call everybody out, doesn't he? Yeah, but it seems it. Seems like he's not interested in it, but it's a shame. Really interesting because he does, he does call people out, doesn't he? So, and obviously, Mickey Theo said, okay, well, I take you on your call out, and it's, it's now not happened, so it would be good to see us. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Well, we wish them both well. Well, all right then. So, Rick, it's been fantastic to have you on. You've been a uh, a good a good addition to the Porky's uh, channel. Yeah, thank you for having me, mate. And uh, I wish you all the best, and I'd like to have you on again, if that's all right. Yeah, nice one. All right, thanks a lot for having me on, mate. It's good you to meet you. Care. Cheers, nice Toby. One. See you later, mate. Cheers. Right.
Uh, that was uh, Toby from Cambridge. Uh, well-spoken young man. Loves his boxing. Uh, see, we don't discriminate on Porky's Corner. Everybody's welcome, whether you're from Scotland or Cornwall. Paul Lepton country and, and all the way from Ireland all the way to is it all to one end to other. Everybody's welcome. If anybody would like to come on the channel, it's porkycorner at mail.com. Just send your email saying I'd like to come on the channel and uh, somebody will be in touch and they'll arrange a slot for you. All right, we like to get different people from all walks of life. Everybody's welcome. All right. So that's about it. I think that's evening over. I'm shattered today. Long day, so all right. So peace out. Keep on trucking. Keep supporting boxing. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit your notification button on your phone. Because then as soon as a video comes out, you'll get a notification and there could be a question in that video for power trainers. <laughs> all right. Peace out.